So when I was little, like six year old, I dreamt to grow up and make a difference, save lives or something. So becoming a cardio surgeon seemed like the obvious choice. And then growing up, things changes. Um, so at Union started, started falling apart and um, economy was crushing. There was energy crisis, there was hunger and cold. And I realized that there were other things that could kill people and there's other ways you could save lives. So I decided to become an economist because economics and making money helps feed people. And then a little later on, I started hearing about climate change and what it can do to people. So apparently there was a possibility that climate change could take lives. And the more I thought about it, I was concerned that they talked about climate change as an environmental problem. But in my head, I knew that it was actually more about energy use, energy and economics. So I needed to master energy. And I had to put those three professions together, environment, energy and economics, to be able to truly understand and address issues of climate change for myself. So what do we know about climate change? And the scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is telling us that we're already observing uh, impacts of one degree warming on the planet. We've already seen retreating Arctic ice. We've already seen changing ecosystems, loss of biodiversity, frequency and severity of extreme weather events. And if we don't do anything, the cost of not doing anything is actually dramatic increase of up to two degrees of the global climate with irreversible losses of ecosystems, arable land, lives and suffering by diversity and a lot of other dramatic consequences to the humanity. There has been enough scientific evidence for 175 country leaders to get together and sign the Paris Agreement on climate change committing to do anything within their power to limit climate change within 1.5 degrees. This is considered to be the climate change which we can actually moderately adapt to. Not perfect, but doable. What does it take to keep climate change to 1.5 degrees increase from pre-industrial levels? It actually does require drastic and dramatic changes to be happening really quickly um, we need to cut our greenhouse gas emissions as much as by nearly half and become carbon neutral by 2050. Do you realize how much action that requires? Is this new science? No, the science was there since 1990. Why hasn't anything happened? The first time Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published the first assessment report in 1990, the science was obvious and unequivocal. Yet all we see is uh, conferences, treaties being signed, international, you know, big meetings with a lot of policymakers gathering, signing a lot of paper. And yet all of this happens combined with a news headline saying that this has been the hottest year in human history on record. Year after year after year. So why are we failing the climate? Why are the words not turning into actions? So I dedicated my career to fighting climate change, curbing carbon. And I thought, that it, I thought that it was a communication and awareness issue. I thought that if we just tell more people, convince and explain, provide more sound scientific arguments, you know, just talk a little more to a little more people, we can make them change the way they do things. And after 10 years, a lot of breath spent, a lot of nerves racked, and quite a few gray hair, I realized that that ain't working. I did realize that we're actually in the environmental camp. We're standing on our boats, screaming at the top of our lungs to other boats out there, other professions, which we're actually speaking different languages with. We don't understand each other. They don't understand us, and we don't understand them. So I had to change the way I talk to people because it turned out it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So, for example, I work with engineers a lot and I usually tell my engineer colleagues that had the engineers been any better in communicating what they think, I would be jobless. I actually made my career explaining complex engineering data to decision makers who have the means and power to change things. So taking that case, I started changing my message. For example, if I'm talking to bankers, instead of convincing them to invest 
in sustainable energy for the sake of climate change mitigation, I talk to them about net present values, paybacks, internal rate of returns, risk management, hedging. I still do it for the sake of the climate, but I don't tell them that. Or when I'm talking to ministers of finance, I'm not convincing them to invest in school energy efficiency for the sake of climate mitigation and indoor air quality. I'm actually telling them that this would help them optimize public budget expenditures and operational cost across the lifetime. Or if I'm talking to industries or farmers, I'm not talking to them about, um, again, the, the case and the benefits of sustainable farming. I'm talking to, to them about the increasing green business market share and the potential profit premiums they can make on certified green goods. So taking this case, we can actually try and seek if there is a way to promote action if we can just make the right case. And the right case is designing decision-making and investments towards sustainability of the environment and towards conservation by keeping economics and business and money at the core of our analysis keeping that as the foundation of our decision making. We're still aiming at environmental conservation and saving the planet, but we need to be very cautious and diligent about making the economic and business case so that we can be understood and supported by decision makers and investors. Now, how can we take this model and take it towards other areas and apply it to larger scale? Um, here are some examples. What can we do now? Now is actually, ironically, it's a good time. In the post-pandemic world, uh, post-crisis economies in COVID-19, are actually trying to streamline a lot of investments to rescue and recover the economy. For example, getting food to the poor. Imagine if you would design a program providing food to the poor, but you would streamline that public spending towards the local small businesses and farmers who are practicing organic farming. It's a win-win. You're helping the poor at the same time you're creating demand for your local green businesses. Or when you're designing a sustainable energy project, you're not just promoting solar or wind power, but you're making sure these power plants are built on otherwise non-fertile, non-arable land or abandoned tailings or offshore even better. Uh, or you're designing a sustainable transportation system with sustainable fuels in place, but also integrated with non-motorized mobility, like bicycles and pedestrians, to make sure that it's an integrated solution and people can switch to walking or bicycles whenever they want to. And there's a myriad of such examples. How do we make sure they actually become investment projects? The approach is simple. Every time we're designing a project or an investment, we need to ask ourselves a question. What are the benefits and costs, the impacts and advantages of my action on the ecosystems, on the natural environment? Once I understand those, I need to put a monetary value on them and include this monetized costs and benefits into my decision making. Think about it. How often does a user of a solar panel or an electric vehicle actually question where their product, this fashionable green product came from? Um, do they actually actually ask a question if it came from contaminated mining or with the use of coal fired power or if their product is gonna end up in toxic waste dump? No. So we need to learn to ask the right questions, the inconvenient questions to design truly sustainable actions. What is missing for that? Since, um, aside from my profession, I've spent the last 20 years teaching university students, I want to address uh, my students and not my students and all the students out there. In the 21st century, the challenges we're facing are leaving us no luxury of having a single profession. I believe that to be able to fit in and truly make a difference, the young people of any discipline need to stand up and embrace more than one profession. We need 
professionals who will get outside of their comfort zone, add one or two more professionals to their toolkit to be able to bring together disparate stakeholders, to be able to explain unclear technical detail from one field to the other, bring synergies to the sector so that they can become this magic link linking conservation, sustainability, environment with engineering, business, finance, law. Look at the beautiful professions that we can have. Environmental justice, law, sociology, and environment. Green building engineers, you know, engineering, environment, artificial intelligence combined in one profession. Um, green transportation experts, you know, that need to do the modeling of transportation models, add it to the technicalities of engineering of transport, adding to that the environmental conservation notions. Or green finance, that the beauty of finance and banking combined with the environmental benefits of sustainable investment projects. Or urban planners. Sustainable urban planning is one of the beauties that our planet needs in the future. Cities with, need to be designed with um, you know, green buildings, green architecture, integrated green spaces. Uh, with green um, infrastructure, with the water infrastructure, with sustainable transportation networks, green spaces, spaces for innovation and happiness. We need those professionals today. So I'm asking you to, wherever you are, at whatever stage of your career or studies you are, to broaden your horizons, add more work, more studies to your agenda. I'm not asking you to get Nobel Prizes in three disciplines. I'm asking you to learn and understand just enough so you could explain things people in the other boat don't understand. So you could be that magic link linking professions and disciplines together. So you could be that catalyzer of sustainable green transformation that not only needs money and technology, but pioneers and missionaries that can actually design, explain, and preach green transformation to those who have the means and power to change things. We need to do that today, otherwise the world as we know it doesn't have a very optimistic future. We need to do this today for the sake of our future generations, your future generations for planet Earth. Thank you.